Hello, and welcome to Monumental, where we sit down with entrepreneurs, leaders, visionaries, and big thinkers making monumental change. Here's your host, Evan Holliday. Welcome to Monumental. I'm your host, Evan Holliday, and today on the show, we have with us Hunter Thompson. Hunter, how you doing, man? Hey, thanks again for having me on. Much appreciated. Yes, I love it. Glad to have you on. And, and actually, just yesterday, uh, Hunter and I were, were talking. He had me on as a guest on his podcast, Cashflow Connections uh, Real Estate Podcast. So go make sure to check out his podcast um, right after you get done listening to this episode. Uh, but a little bit about Hunter before we get started. He's a full-time real estate investor and founder of ASIM Capital, which we'll get into the meaning of, of the name. Uh, but ASIM Capital is a private equity firm based out of L.A., and since starting ASIM Capital, he has helped raise hundreds of investors allocate capital to over 100 properties. In addition, he, as an experienced investor, Hunter is also the author of Raising Capital for Real Estate. And like I mentioned, he's the host of Cashflow Connections Real Estate Podcast. Um, so with that, Hunter, let's just dive right into a little bit of your backstory and how, how you got to where you are today. Yeah. So, you know, first of all, thanks again for having me on. Um, I think a lot of people, when they start to tell their story about real estate, 2008 plays some sort of role. For me, I was very insulated from that massive trauma that took place because I was finishing up college at the time. So when I saw what happened in 2008, basically that was a, a green light for me rather than a yeah. red light to just focus all my energy to learn as much as I could about financial assets. And I did what most people do when they want to learn about finance, which is study the stock market and started studying Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger and trying to mimic the way that they valued stocks in particular value long-term and started investing and started seeing success from my own personal portfolio as most people did that started in 2008. But it wasn't really until 2010 where I realized I couldn't predict the outcome of my stock portfolio. And 2010 is something that not enough people talk about, which is the European debt crisis. It's very similar to what happened in the United States in 2008. A lot of European banks froze up. Central banks were bailing out industries. Central banks themselves needed to be bailed out. And there was a complete lack of liquidity in the market. And it was causing unbelievable volatility in the U.S. markets. And I remember thinking, you know, after all these books I've run, all these research topics that I've researched, something as obscure as the Greek bond yields is playing a huge and huge impactful and meaningful uh, determining factor in my entire portfolio. And I just realized this is no matter what, I could not do this. I could not have mitigated this risk. I need to find a vehicle that's straightforward enough so that a small firm or a family off individual can conduct accurate due diligence. And that quickly led me to real estate. And you know, later, that quickly led me to this conversation with you. Yes, I love it. Um, what were you doing prior to real estate? So, I mean, I was an entrepreneur from a very young age, you know, starting selling parking spaces when I was five years old. I did Cutco, which is probably my most yeah. normal job um, going through college. And I also had a background as an online poker player. I was very fortunate to be involved in the online poker world when something called the poker boom took place. Um, if you research that term, it's a hundred million, multi-hundred million dollar boom that took place as a result of someone who was an accountant winning the World Series after basically playing a tournament that was $16, winning that tournament, that got him an entrance into another tournament, which was typically a $200 entrance. He won that tournament, which got him entrance into the World Series, and then he won the World Series and won a million dollars. And basically everyone and their mother thought they could be a professional poker player. And this yeah. created something called the Poker Boom, which if you were a college student, and understood how to learn complicated and challenging things on the internet, you could get a coach, follow other people's moves, and you know, make a solid living for yourself without a boss, which is what most college students want. And so that was my entrance into the real estate sector was a result of taking my money offline. Hmm. And my first investments were from poker funds. That's really cool. Um, one of my very good friends is a has been, I think for the past six or seven years, professional poker player, but he did a lot of what, uh, what you said is he made a lot of his money originally online, online poker. Mm. 
Um, but I love how you turned that and you said, okay, I made this money online. Let me put it into hard assets and let me put it into real estate where going back to what you said, like it's something you can control and something you can determine to a degree your outcome. Um, so, so let's dive into real estate. So what, what walk us through your first deal? What was that like? So I was very, again, one of, you know, everyone has their own strengths and weaknesses. I think as an investor, one of my strengths is when everyone is looking left, I can go right. Um, that was very, very pronounced during 2008. But I also was very fortunate in the sense that I moved to California in the wake of that crisis. And in California, the downturn was very pronounced. And so when I started to build my career, I ended up networking with people who were able to weather that storm and was able to leapfrog a lot of those initial investment vehicles that most people do when they start out investing because I was mimicking the investment strategies of very sophisticated, very savvy individuals that had institutional backgrounds. And so my first investments were in commercial real estate syndications of purchase prices in the 15 to $50 million range. You hear a lot of people that started with single family houses. They end up hitting some ceiling because of that and the lack of scalability there. And then eventually transition into commercial. Um, that wasn't really because of the fact that I had the foresight. It was just the market timing. Not only was it very fortunate in terms of the valuations were very low, but it filtered out a lot of bad ideas that weren't recession resistant. So always got to be humble about that and mindful of that. So my first investments were in things like mobile home parks, self-storage facilities, multifamily apartments, and also some retail and office. And basically, as soon as I understood, wow, I can identify best in class operators, defer to their expertise, defer to their relationships and their access to capital, and their access to brokers and lenders, and have them implement strategies that they've implemented over decades. And I can basically receive the majority of the proceeds I'm going to do that nine times out of 10. And, you know, we work with sponsors today that if I spent the next decade only working in one particular vertical in real estate, I'd probably be half as good as them. And so if I can receive 70% of the proceeds, I'm getting the benefit of those 70% of the proceeds, but also the diversification that goes along with being a passive investor across multiple asset classes. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love, I love your approach and your mindset and your, your view on it as you know why why reinvent the wheel first off um but even before that it sounds like you a great point you were working with and mimicking savvy real estate investors and you weren't starting on the bottom by teaching yourself how to flip a house um which a lot of people get into because that's they think that's the only option but you're right i mean you can almost like get in the back door of high level real estate investing by jumping right in and, and learning from somebody who's already at that institutional level. Um, Agreed. That's very similar to what I did as well. It was like, you know, right out of, right out of college working for somebody that was a, one of the top developers in the country. And then all of a sudden you learn their, their ins and outs, you learn how they operate and you're able to gain that confidence and that knowledge to be able to, to do similar deals like that yourself. Absolutely. And if you're listening to this at home and you're in the process of starting your career and you really want to leapfrog a lot of those initial steps, this is something that's, it's a mindset. It's basically shooting for that level and rubbing elbows with those people and finding a way to inspire them to give you all their trade secrets. And this is something that pretty much everyone that's successful in the business state has done successfully. That's something I talk about in my book, which is if you can generate your own momentum, that is something that people that you want to be mentored by are very inspired by because to a certain extent, they see themselves in you. Momentum is something that's very, very rare. Most people are out looking for someone to get started for them. If you can present yourself in such a way that says, hey, man, I'm going this way and I'm going fast. The question is, do you want to be a partner or do you want to be a competitor? And yeah. the right people are very inspired to open up the playbook. I know you had a situation very similar to that, where it's like these guys spent decades learning something that's very lucrative, learning something that's extremely complicated that attracts everyone from Carl Icahn to Warren Buffett. And they'll just open up the playbook because they know intuitively 
Successful people tend to be very competitive, but it doesn't necessarily mean, oh, I'm going to do better than him. Sometimes successful people are competitive in the sense of watch how many lives I can positively influence because of the position that I'm in, which is really powerful to tap into. Yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. So as far as it going along your journey, and I also love how you tapped into like you, you basically are taking one piece of the real estate pie, the capital side, which pretty much every deal needs in some form or fashion to be able to realize a dream or realize the opportunity. And you're filling that plug and filling, helping these operators who may not have the time or effort or resources you're helping them with that capital component. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, this is going to be a claim that I don't even know if people are comfortable with this reality, but I'm just going to make the statement. The capital side of the business and being able to raise capital is the most lucrative, sought after, and consistently important skill in the entire real estate business. It's the one skill that if you can master the ability to make millions of dollars appear prior to close, you'll never have to worry about it having a job in the real estate sector. And just so happens that it's the part of the business that I love. And I mean, truly, that's my unique ability. It's the thing that I want to spend 16 hours a day working on. And if I do that, it feels like I never worked. And there are other people out there in the real estate business that their unique ability, their thing that they want to focus on is not in any way related to capital raising. And so what we do as a firm is joint venture with companies that are very much focused on the operational side of things. And we handle everything re regarding investor relations. So issuing distributions, talking to investors, you know, issuing tax documents, some administratively burdensome things. But the reality is I like that quality assurance. And so that's how we're positioned in the marketplace. I'm a huge proponent of the division of labor. And so I want to do it like that. Yeah, I love that. And as far as like you getting into this space, uh, what was that like as far as doing those first initial deals and capital raising for the first time? Yeah, so this is a really important question. This is actually why I felt motivated to write the book. So in 2012, 2013, I had already had a couple of years of success of um, investing personally in the mobile home park business. So I just felt like back then, especially you know, for those of you that are relatively new to the space, legitimate trailing 12, 10 caps and 12 caps were available. That is not an exaggeration. We were investing in them. And I was basically so shocked that this was a reality. Are you kidding me? There's all this demand, 10,000 baby boomers hitting the age of retirement every single day. Very little of them have any savings whatsoever. The average two bedroom apartment is about $1,400 a month. The average social security check is about $1,200 a month. So it's just mathematically the reality that there's going to be a tremendous demand for affordable housing. And I know you're sympathetic to that. Oh yeah. On the other side of things, basically there's less and less mobile home parks every single year. They're just not building new ones. So that's a big picture thesis, but we also identified an operating partner that was very well positioned to take advantage of that thesis and that massive tailwind. And so I started investing myself, started to experience success and decided, okay, I'm going to build a career out of the capital raising side of the business. I created my own entity and wanted to have my investors fund into that entity and that entity's sole purpose was to invest in another entity. And so the compensation to me was derived not from the operating partner, but from the investing entity itself. And that's an important distinction. We can talk about why, but the point is it's a very straightforward way to create your own fund. And I had this idea. I'm sitting here extremely knowledgeable about the mobile home park business now, but I certainly was back then as well. Ability to communicate, had a background in, in sales and anything I was passionate about, I could communicate effectively. And had this luncheon where 30 accredited investors came, so basically $30 million sitting in the room, presented for 45 minutes on this topic and raised a gross total of zero dollars <laughs> on my face. That's amazing. You know, it was. Of ter it was terrifying, right? I mean, the yeah. financial component was one thing, but the emotional component, again, I said everyone has their strengths and weaknesses. My weakness is that embarrassment. Just having to call your friends and family when they're texting you saying, how'd the raise go? Was it 1 million or two? And you go, it was none million. Yeah. Dollar. Wow. So my takeaway from that after a couple of 
days of sitting alone crying to myself <laughs> was that even if I was knowledgeable, I didn't have the ability to have a room full of people, especially successful people, go through a pseudo-religious experience in a 20-minute presentation or a 30-minute presentation. I didn't want to go around chasing investors around. I wanted to have them chase me. I need to build an infrastructure that educates and to a certain extent indoctrinates people who are already interested in the topic so that by the time I got on the phone with them, they're interested in investing. And this yeah. was what I spent the last decade of my life working on. Yeah. And I, I think you've done a tremendous job of that. And I, that's something we talk about all the time on Monumental is like building up your platform. And so you can have a platform to speak from, platform to connect with other other guests and, and really namely what you and I do is podcasting. Also you're writing books, you're writing articles, you're writing and creating free content for people. And then exactly what you said, like you're creating this education so that way people want to come to you. They trust you. They like you. They know you. They're like Hunter is the guy that's going to take care of my capital and he's going to make sense of, of where to head in the market and, and what kind of deals I should be looking for and where I should be placing my capital. I trust Hunter. So you're exactly right. That's, that's what we're doing day in, day out. That's, that's what this all builds up to. Yeah, exactly right. And again, it's kind of what Orrin Claff talks about, who's the author of Pitch Anything, was very kind enough to give me a quote on my book, which is actually on the back cover. But you do not want to feel needy. And anyone in the real estate business has done that thing where you have a great deal, it's under contract, it's set to close, and the money doesn't appear. And then all of a sudden, you got to call all your random relatives that you haven't talked to in months. You call your random rich uncle and say, oh my gosh, you need to borrow 100 grand for like three days. Trust me, it'll come right back. That is a position I never want to be in. And the platform allows me to never be in that position. The platform allows me to have people lining up to invest. And by the way, if your listeners are interested in building their own platform, being authentic and being honest is the one and only way that this can be done in any manner that's scalable and lucrative, but also the more honest and lucrative you are, uh, excuse me, the more honest and authentic you are, and the less you hide the things that you're embarrassed about, the more likely your clients are going to be your ideal clients that are going to invest with you for decades to come. And then it's just like every day is a blessing because every conversation with someone that sees eye to eye with you and shares your worldview. And that's such an alleviating feeling. Anyone that's worried about going public with your weird ideas about all the you know, stuff that you're not supposed to talk about, politics, religion, or fam familiar relationships. Once you start to unveil that stuff, people come out of the woodwork and are so excited and are actually engaged with you on a meaningful level. And I'm just a huge proponent of that. Can you give, uh, give our listeners an example of, of a time where you did that? Oh, gosh. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I'll put it this way. From a big picture perspective, any time that you have some thought in your own mind and you go steer away from that because that's unpopular, you need to remember that this is like a, a radical change that take, that's taking place in society at a rate that our psyche hasn't developed to yet. Like from a historical standpoint, if we're in a small tribe, I want everyone to like me a little bit because if the one person that doesn't like me has access to the food, I'm going to die. That is not realistic in today's society. I don't care about having a little bit of buy-in from everyone. I need a buy-in from just a few hundred people. And that few hundred people can change the entire perspective of your financial future. Um, as an example, though, um, I have a very strong libertarian free market perspective. And even I would consider myself an anarcho-capitalist, meaning that not only does the government not do a good job at solving really complex problems, but that the market can provide incredibly complicated services, yes, including the police and military. So what I just said right there is pretty much not popular anywhere, but I guarantee there's someone listening to this that's at least interested in that concept, and they might be the one that sent me an email go, where did you get that idea? Or, oh, I'm sure you're familiar with this, this, and this person. I never knew anyone else that was. It's a very cool thing. So not that it has anything to do with real estate directly, yeah. but it's an interesting thing about me, and I can use it because it's honest and true. Yeah, and it is, it is Hunter Thompson, right? Exactly, exactly. what you said. Um, I think that's a great point. I, I think not enough people talk about that. 
is if you're going to make a platform, if you're going to put all this time and energy and effort into creating it, don't be fake. Don't put up a facade. Don't try to create another personality um, for your, your yes. online world yes. or your oh, online gosh. friends. It's exhausting. Yeah. It's and it, right. yeah, honestly. Yeah. Sorry. What were you saying? Oh, the, the concern is that you'll always be found out and this yeah. will eliminate that forever. So if you're honest and open about the interesting thing, I gave you one example that I don't even, I've said that maybe a couple of times in my podcast, but it's not really that consequential. My point is if you don't do that, you're scared that in 10 years when you've created this awesome thing that someone's going to go, I found out Hunter's an anarchist, <laughs> so, but I'm just undisruptible because it's like yeah. something open about, you know? Yeah. I, I think that's spot on. I think you're right. I mean, in this day and age, you really, you know, there's that article, the, I forget article or whatever it was, but the thousand true fans, um, you see it a lot. Tim Ferriss made it famous. Um, and it's just about like, you really just need most people today really just need a thousand true fans that will buy whatever you put out, will devour any piece of content because they are so devoted to whatever your mission is that they will go with you wherever you go. And those are the only thousand people that you need to be targeting. Couldn't agree more. I mean, look, we can put some math on that. If you have a thousand accredited investors that are willing to invest $65,000 with you every time you put a deal out, that's $65 million of equity. Yeah. If you use leverage with that, you're talking about you know, $180 million of real estate that you can buy in one year. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's exactly right. Powerful. And um, yeah, and, and to even compound on that, think about like what you're doing is you're leveraging multiple operators, multiple deals, diversifying where your deals are coming from and being able to, to place that equity over many, many different other operators' deals. So I think that's powerful. It goes in again to, to leverage of your time and the capital you're bringing into these deals. Yep, exactly. That's the business plan. So, um, so walk us through a little bit right now we're, we're going through COVID-19 and, and, you mm. know, maybe somebody here in this five years from now, there, there's going to be some other, you know, uncertainty in the market. Um, how are you able to raise capital in a time of uncertainty and a time where the market, at least currently at the moment is, is uncertain. Everybody doesn't know what's going on, what the future holds. People are kind of like, some are wait and see. How are you negotiate or navigating this? Okay. So that's a really important question. And as far as how I'm raising capital right now, April 1st, not at all. It's too much of a question mark. There's too much uncertainty for people that are doing deals and now retrading based on what's available to us. What are you retrading at? I mean, I'm genuinely curious. It's Real estate, commercial real estate in particular, trades on a multiple of income. If the income is not reliable to a large degree, is it a good deal if you're getting a 10% discount or a 20% discount? I mean, it's really uncertain right now. Now, there, of course, are except, uh, exceptions to that rule. And like I mentioned, going right when everyone uh, is looking left is very lucrative as a real estate investor and an entrepreneur. But what I'll say, one of the amazing benefits of real estate is that it tends to move more like a barge than like a kite. Like the stock market just goes ups and down and all around and a yeah. barge is slow. So trust me, when I was getting into the business in 2010, people were saying, this is an opportunity of a lifetime. Guess what? They were right. But two years later, I grew my knowledge, grew my network to the extent that the deals I saw in 2012 were better than the deals I saw in 2010. And that same thing is going on right now. You're not going to miss the opportunity of a lifetime as long as you're always taking action. So it's not that I'm sitting around, quote, waiting and seeing. I'm doing everything I can to get in front of more investors, coach them through this. I think generally speaking, you and your investors and your listener base are well positioned to emotionally overcome this hurdle. You know, I think that investors, any conversation that I have with someone I respect, if it's longer than 20 minutes, we 100% talk about when the next correction is going to be and how significant it's going to be, at least for the last five years. Meaning that we're certain, like somewhat callous to this concept that what this means is that people lose equity in their homes. Someone's best friend's going to lose their job. Businesses are going to close down. Now we're seeing it 
And so the opportunity is to take advantage of the pricing arbitrage, but you don't have to be the first one in. So right now what I'm focusing on yeah. is educating the base, making sure that they understand that we're well prepared for this, well positioned for this, and that we're going to navigate it successfully just like we did last time when everywhere you'd go, people were saying real estate is a downward spiral to nothing and we were buying. Yeah, I love it. And as far as, and, and I love what you're saying about like first is educate and then is figuring out where the market's headed. And, and I think a big piece of education is also that communication, right? Like it's over communicating right now with all your investors, all your partners, seeing where people's heads are at and, and also helping them navigate through it because everybody's going through their own version of this. Um, so I think getting a pulse of that and then seeing, okay, well, Let's see where the, where the opportunity lies one, two, three months from now, um, and then be prepared to capitalize on it instead of being caught with our pants down and not really you know, being prepared for it. If we're not putting in the work now, then when the opportunity actually arises, we're going to be unprepared. Exactly. You know, if you're in the business of real estate, you can expect there's going to be a little bit of an attrition factor when there is this. So if you're used to raising $2 million or $5 million, I would anticipate unless you're doing a lot of work to overcome this massive hurdle, that 50% of your investor base is probably not going to move forward on your next deal unless you're priming them to do so. Um, something else I wanted to mention is that we are all of us operate on a scale of emotional stability. Let's say one is like not a problem. 10 is like everything's going crazy in the verge of emotional breakdown. When something like this happens, it can bump us up into that eight range where, you know, the slightest little thing can make us feel like we're having a terrible day. You know, you drop your cup of water and you're like, this is exactly what would be happening to me. <laughs> if you're just already up there. Yeah. It's really important to recalibrate both um, emotionally and financially because the one, two punch is historically what always happens. So you think about it, like, first of all, from an emotional standpoint, how many times have you heard the story? Well, my business closed down and then I hurt my back. And that was the, everything has not been the same since from an economic standpoint, it's the dot com bubble burst and then nine 11 happened. It's the housing market crashed and then the global economy crashed. It's the, COVID-19 crisis took place and then the corporate debt bubble happened. These are the things you have to be prepared for. So when you're at an eight, both emotionally and financially, prepare yourself, get back down to that two, do some meditating, start working out, start saving yeah. and so that you can be the person that's going to lead your family, your friend group through this. Yeah, that's great advice. Guys, anybody, if, if you're going through that, if you feel like you're at that emotionally high level right now, do exactly what Hunter just said, you know, do what you can to control your experience and anything you can control, um, bring that back in and, and look at like meditating, you know, um, going for walks, different things that you can do be like, all right, let's, let's take a global approach to this, this too shall pass and let's figure out how we can move forward from this. Love it. So speaking of which, um, I would love to hear kind of, your your thoughts and your feedback and, and how you're staying level-headed throughout all of this. So from a big picture perspective, I mentioned that it's April 1st. This is the first time that people have had to pay rent. And so up until this point, I kind of in jest have said that it's like the, the coyote uh, cartoon where the guy runs off the building or runs off the thing and he yeah. can't see you know what I mean? Can't, he looks down for the first time. That's when he falls. He's waiting so, to, yeah. Exactly. There's a little bit of that concern, right? And I talked to some multifamily operators that I have a lot of respect for that own at least a half a billion dollars of real estate. And they genuinely, jokingly, but genuinely said, you know, we're prepared for collections to increase somewhere between 10% and 60%. Like that's a huge delta. Yeah, that that's is. Why I said, you know, it's hard to buy a deal with that kind of delta. Yeah. So things are fine right now. I personally think that April 1st isn't nearly as important as May 1st for a lot of reasons. A lot of families can float themselves for a month or a half a month. A lot of businesses can float themselves for a month or two months. So if something doesn't change, that May 1st number is much more important. Um, from a big picture, again, we're very well protected because we've been focusing on the mobile home park business the self-storage business, which is very insulated from this. We recently closed a deal in the senior living space 
which does have some risk of the, the tenant base is obviously in the higher risk profile with this particular virus, but there's a lot of tailwinds in terms of the long term. So yeah. we're interested in how it plays out. Our principal is well protected, we believe, and the cash flow is, is very, very strong. We're actually above pro forma. But the question is, are these supplies for these medical issues going to be a challenge? Yeah. Uh, are we going to be able to get new tenants in if someone were to pass away? And so we're going to price that in and we're going to just be super conscious with our reserves and get through it. What about if um, anybody listening now has a deal under contract right now, um, either beginning, you know, just got it under contract. What, what advice would you have for them? Yeah. So it's going to be very dependent. It's not a cop out, just being honest. You know, there is a deal that one of our operating partners is closing on that there isn't going to be a retrade. Yeah. Um, they purchased it at a basis that they feel comfortable with. It's in an asset class, uh, mobile home parks that they believe aren't as susceptible to this particular risk. And so they're moving forward. Um, if you're in retail, for example, talk about the one, two punch. Amazon presents a major risk. You had businesses like, okay, we're at the eight out of 10, but we've overcome this. And yeah. now there's a real pause on that industry. You know, I would say that it's very challenging to transact in the retail business right now. I mean, I would think that's almost impossible unless it's a kind of thing that you're going to take down the whole thing and build it up again. And the time that you're going to take to do that, you're anticipating overcoming this challenge. But if it's just a matter of buying the in-place income, that in-place income is not very reliable. Yeah, it's very unreliable. Um, yeah, no, I love that. That's great advice. As far as um, what, what you're doing to best be prepared and, and any advice you have for our listeners to be like, how can we massively grow from this time of uncertainty? Um, what advice would you have there? Well, I'll put it this way. Um, one of my favorite websites is Cura.com, Q-U-O-R-A, I believe.com, where you can ask questions and get interesting answers in their crowdsource. So you can get answers to really cool things that you would not have any kind of tie to. Uh, one of the questions is, what is it like to work with Elon Musk? And so people respond that have worked with him. And probably the most interesting thing I've ever read on that website was, you know, Elon Musk invested, I believe, $100 million of his own money and basically a third of his net worth at the time uh, into SpaceX. And the first rocket launch wasn't successful. And the second rocket launch well, they basically had three rocket launches. They had the run rate to basically do three rocket launches. The first one wasn't successful. And the second one blew up. And that moment was a moment of, all right, are we going to sit and fold? Or is this goal and mission worth the risk of pursuing on forward and taking that third launch? And so the person that answers the question talks about the speech that Elon gave after that second launch was a disaster. And I think that everyone in the office, I mean, imagine what this, there's all these scientists that have given up holidays that have worked nights and days. And this is what their whole life is about. It's like a massive project that they put yeah. energy, energy towards and they literally saw it go up in flames, not metaphorically, like it blew up. And so I think that they were expecting him to come up and say, well, we've, we failed and I'm so sorry, but no, he said, look guys, it's literally rocket science. We knew this was going to be hard. And the reason we said that we had three tries is because we thought it might take three times. We're going to crush it, get back to work. And now we all know SpaceX. So that's what we're wow. in. It's the question of, are we going to fold or are we going to take this opportunity? I'll just say one more thing. I've been long winded because I enjoy these conversations, mm -hmm. but like I mentioned, every conversation as an investor that we've had over the last five years has been when is there going to be a correction? I'm so excited. I can't wait to deploy capital without fearing that we're overpaying. But then when it actually yeah. happens, everyone goes, but not like this. And that is what it sounds like every time. So the emotional preparedness and the emotional stability is the name of the game. And then you can take advantage of the pricing arbitrage while being respectful of people that are going through challenging times. Yeah. Yeah. So much value right there. I love that. Um, first off, I love the Elon Musk um, story because I think that everybody looks up to Elon Musk, but nobody, you know, not enough people like pull back the curtain to say, what is he really doing to, to, to get to where his level of success is? And I think you're spot on is like, if you have that 
that um, commitment to your goals, to your desires, to your purpose, to your mission, if you have that commitment to yourself, then you're going to keep going until you're successful. Um, and that's, that's very true with any, any sort of upside, downside in the economy. I mean, this is going to happen again. You know, we're all going to go through this many times in our lifetime. It's just how we respond to it, how we pick ourselves back up, how we move forward. Um, and like you said about the, the capital, I've, I've heard a lot of that too. It's like, it was like, well, I didn't see this coming and you know, I couldn't prepare for this. And, and I, I agree. I mean, it is very unique, but also you have to figure out, okay, well, this is what it is, right? We're all going through a unique situation. We're all going through it together. How do we all come out better for it? And how do we take advantage of these price arbitrages and maybe sellers that need liquidity quickly or whatever it is? Like, how do we jump on that as soon as possible? Um, and, and line up capital that is available, uh, that is willing and motivated to move and knows an opportunity when they see one. Exactly right. Exactly right. It's the name of the game. It's the only option. Yeah. And that, and that co coincidentally, I think, ties back into what we were talking about earlier about platforms. Um, because I think those like yourself and, and what we're doing with Monumental, like people they've we've been around for years especially you've been doing this a lot longer than i have and people know you and people um, have worked with you previously they've seen your your um, transparency your work ethic like all these different things so they know you they like you they're much more likely in times of uncertainty like this going to turn to you instead of maybe an unexperienced operator or somebody they don't know yeah it's a great point i mean it's just you're in such a great opportunity to build this. And as investors, we want to look at things on a risk adjusted basis. You know, what you're looking at right now, and again, I appreciate you allowing me to come on your program. We met at a conference and within five minutes, it was established, you're interesting. You think I'm interesting. Let's create this. And now it's something that we're never going to forget. The yeah. risk adjusted return is just so favorable. It's not like it's me and my computer and a microphone and a team of 50 people in the back telling me, don't say the thing about the anarchist stuff anymore. <laughs> you don't have the overhead. Um, and the business wouldn't work with that. So it's only, you know, a thousand dollars and we get to create this amazing platform. So if you're interested at home and you're contemplating doing this, I, in the book, I talk about writing down a hundred topics of potential articles that you may write just a hundred topics yeah. and then sort them in terms of how closely aligned to your business they are and write the the most aligned write the first 10 that come to mind that are very aligned to your business and that's the beginning of your platform and you'll see people come in that like your perspective and if you write the articles not with the intention of cramming keywords but write the articles with the attention of thinking that someone may read them and then say to their friend, wow, I'm going to share this because of how smart it makes me look. That's the type of content that you want to write. It's very powerful. That's awesome. That's, that's a great way to put it too. And in for all of our listeners, like I love that read, somebody's going to read it and say, wow, and then send it to one of their friends and look smart for doing it. You're exactly right. I mean, we all share articles at some point or another with friends or family or, or our loved ones. And, and it typically is the most interesting articles or the ones that we think are going to change the perspective or have changed our perspective that we want to share. It's an interesting take. It's the kind of thing that they don't even have to agree with it, but they're going to say, whoa, never thought about it like that. And, you know, I mean, there's a million ideas. The impact of coronavirus on real estate, the correspondence between interest rates and housing prices, the difference between the federal funds rate and uh, mortgage rates. There's a couple right there. And your take is going to be different than mine. So go ahead and take them and, yeah. um, you know, write them with that same intention. Yeah, I love it. Um, well, can you, can you give our listeners one, one last piece of advice as far as capital raising um, for the long term heading out of this? Yeah, I think that a lot of people think about, well, for the long term, it's always about the same perspective, which is that people think about themselves in the middle of the circle and going out to convince someone to invest with them. And you're thinking about, okay, my, that person over there probably has $50,000. If I go have a meeting with him, I may leave that meeting with an additional $50,000 commitment. Um, that is not scalable. You can't go and have all those meetings and try to build a like a successful real estate company 
you have to position yourself so that people are finding you. And by the time that you talk to them, they're already interested in investing. They're just trying to figure out if you're actually a person that actually exists. And, you know, I, I told a story about failing to raise a half a million dollars or failing to raise any money on my first capital raise. I will frequently get emails from people that want to invest a quarter million or $300,000 with me after not more than a phone call. And that phone call is just as much for them to vet me as for me to vet them. So put yourself on equal footing with your client base. Understand that there's not an overwhelming glut of amazing real estate deals out there. The negative interest rate bond market is like $15 trillion. That is the glut. That is the enemy. You have the prize. So contemplate it like that and have your conversations in a manner that is, is conducive to that. Yeah, that's great advice. I think you're, you're spot on where, um, you know, people finding you and, and, you know, within a matter of minutes, you can have commitments now instead of having to go through all these coffee meetings, these lunch meetings, um, to be able to, to get 50,000 here, 50,000 there. You're exactly right. I mean, it's amazing just from, even from monumental. I mean, people come out to me and say, Hey, we have lots of money. Where are your next round of deals? And it's amazing. I'm like, I like, we just met and, and that's honestly part of the reason I think um, we started Monumental, you know, one of 10 reasons. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I heard Joe Fairless say it on his podcast. It was like, yeah, I have people reaching out to me all the time saying, we want to give you money, Joe. And he's like, I don't even know you. You're giving, wanting to <laughs> fund our next deal. So it's amazing how that works. Um, so I, I, I love to bring it up. I love to talk about it. And I, I love talking about it with, with people like yourself who are, are clearly demonstrating that it works. Yeah, definitely. It changed the face of my business. And part of the reason is that, you know, it may feel like they don't know you, but there are listeners of your show that know you better than some of your best friends when it comes to certain topics. Yeah. And that's, what's really powerful. It's just more scalable because you're having those conversations with a lot of people at the same time. So they do know you. In fact, they know things about you that some of your best friends don't even know. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, I love when people are like, like, so how'd that, uh, how'd that trip go that you went on or how'd this go? And, and people I probably never have talked to before, but it's exactly it's powerful. Um, well, let's jump into our monumental questions. Cool. What does success mean to you? Oh, man, it's freedom, right? And I want to clarify this because if you're listening to this or watching this, you are listening to two people that undoubtedly got into the world of real estate because the amount of freedom it can provide. But the word there is can, right? I work 50, 60 hours a week, unquestionable. I take the time off. Things happen where I can't talk to my wife. I got to focus on this and that and the other thing. But the idea is I could take the time off if I wanted to. Yeah. So the freedom is actually just knowing that you can, not necessarily taking all the time off, but actually knowing that you have the freedom to do so. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, what about daily habits or morning rituals that you have? I want to be working out on a high level always, not in terms of like anything elite, but in terms of like what I'm physically capable of. I just got done running my first marathon first and last I might add, but um, was <laughs> nice. really motivated for that. Spent 12 weeks training for that and was really happy with the way it turned out. I did it in 310, by the way, if any of you wow. guys runners out there. So seven fifteens per mile. It was awesome. And now I'm back to like the CrossFit thing. I'm recovering from an injury, but working out, especially lifting, um, is an awesome daily habit. Are you, uh, you doing CrossFit from home now? Well, yes. I mean, I'm actually recovering from a wrist injury. That's why I did the marathon because I needed to stop lifting for a little bit. Um, so right now I'm, it's very light. It's more like a more advanced physical therapy, but yes, I did get a noise complaint from the neighbors because I quote, <laughs> have been jumping up and down. <laughs> yeah, right. That's awesome. Um, what about uh, favorite book or book you're currently reading? All, there's ones that everyone is familiar with. One that I really like that doesn't get talked about enough is Double Double by Cameron Harold. And then he also co-wrote Miracle Mornings for Entrepreneurs. A lot of your listeners are probably familiar with Miracle mm -hmm. Mornings, but the one for Entrepreneurs is co-written by Cameron Harold, who is very much the operations side of things, very practical and tactical. And then the other side of things, which is like meditation and envisioning your future and those types of things. That's a good combination to have. And by the way, you've heard me talk about meditation twice now. 
If you're the kind of person that's like, I'm super analytical. I really like the science of it. I don't really want to do any meditation. Well, guess what? You're not being analytical and you're not being objective because when most of the successful people you look up to are talking about meditating and you're just ignoring it, um, you should probably look into it. It's a good way to spend that 10 minutes a day. Yeah. Yeah. That's really is just 10 minutes is all you have to put into it. Um, and it's an investment in, in your, your sanity. I mean, I think I, I'm coming up on f- like four years of doing it. Um, and it's just, oh, really cool. Yeah. It's, it's a game changer. I mean, Spoiler, it, it right? really is. Um, so I love you brought that up. Uh, double, double. I, I haven't read that one. I've read, um, vivid vision, I think was Cameron Harold. Okay, well. cool. So you're familiar with him. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know you, like most people would be, but yes, I'm a big fan of his. That's awesome. Um, well, Hunter, amazing value today. Glad, glad to have you on the show. Uh, I know our listeners are going to get a lot out of this. Um, where can they connect with you, follow you, reach out to you? Yeah. And again, I appreciate it. So I mentioned the book a couple of times. We're giving away, we wanted to give away the first thousand copies, but then they got it given away really quickly. So we're giving away the first 5,000 copies of the book. You can get it. All you have to do is pay for the shipping at Raising Capital for Real Estate. Dot com. If you want to learn about investing with me, it's asymcapital.com. And the podcast is free, Cash Flow Connections, which is three words, Cash Flow Connections, real estate podcast. A lot of good content on there from guests that I have a lot of respect for, including your host. Yes. Yes, guys, take Hunter up on all of it. Uh, and we'll put a link to all that in the show notes as well. Um, so guys, if you enjoyed today's episode, Make sure to share it on social media, tag Hunter, tag myself. Let us know you're listening. Let us know what you enjoyed. And do not forget to rate us on iTunes or wherever you're listening today. And with that, guys, have a monumental day. 